Kevin Jackson Radio Show. A UPS truck, wait, take that back, a fake UPS truck was stopped carrying 77 illegals. Welcome everybody, it's the Kevin Jackson Show, glad you're with me. And the reason why this story is so interesting is because it talks about the uh, the guy who gets caught do- delivering these 77 illegals isn't going to be prosecuted or something. I was like, what are you talking about? You might be asking yourself the same thing. Here's what happened. A CHP, that's a California Highway Patrol, CHIP officer, pulled over what appeared to be a brown UPS truck. This was on January the 29th, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Truck had been weaving on old Highway 80, didn't have any tags. And so the cop says, whoa, hang on a second. I'm pulling you over. Pulls the guy over. A Border Patrol agent driving by asked the officer if he needed help. Siler, accused of being the truck's driver, this is the guy that they got out of the truck, was already in the highway patrol vehicle by then. So aside from the weaving, the agent also observed that this truck was riding really low and it had a fresh coat of paint on the rear. See, when he went up to it after he pulls it over, this is the part of the story that really cracked me up. <laughs> he smelled body odor. <laughs> Mixed with the scent of a soap that's popular in Mexico. <laughs> now, that is one observant officer. <laughs> oh, well, I guess they don't have ivory or Irish spring in Mexico. <laughs> All I can tell you, five o'clock in the afternoon in California, <laughs> seven, 77 banditos in the back of a fake UPS vehicle, <laughs> man, that had to be a funk fest. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it would have made George Clinton proud. <laughs> Woo! Wow, man. I've come up on some nasty stuff. That, that I'm just saying, the dude smelled. Don't look at me like I'm crazy, like I'm being, you know, mean or anything. I'm not. I'm saying... Dude sees, okay, he's, look, he's got enough evidence. It's weaving, probably because the people may have been shifting, right? And the winds, who knows? Maybe it was just a fact that that many bodies, I mean, figure the average person, 150 pounds. I mean, at 100 pounds, 77, that's almost 80,000 pounds. At 100 pounds. So you figure everybody's at least buck fifty. I know Mexicans aren't that big necessarily, but then there are some that are. They can get as big as Samoans. So you're probably talking about a hundred to hundred and fifty thousand pounds in a truck that's not meant to carry that kind of weight. It carries mail, right? So I don't know what the do you look, look. Do you want to Google the standards on a UPS truck? I don't. I mean, I've seen them. I've been in them because my books came in one time and look it's not meant for that many folks so i can imagine how this dude is trying to keep this truck on the road you know he knows he's guilty he's doing something illegal but and then so he he gets pulled over and uh you know the jig is up guy's name is siler he's a u.s citizen said the truck was his (laughs) when he got pulled over and he gave the (laughs) he gave the cops permission to search and there were 77 people, including five minors, inside, sweating heavily and standing shoulder to shoulder. I want you to think about the narrative of the left that, you know, America is a terrible country. We are oppressive to people and we downtrodden. And there are people standing shoulder to shoulder. You've seen the inside of the UPS truck. Now, even if he gutted it out, it's still tough. I'm just telling you, that is a lot of folks. And unless he did weight distribution properly, it's tough to move that many people down the road. You know he didn't have those handles up like they do in the subways and in in trains and stuff. No, uh uh-uh. You know he didn't have that up. Sweating heavily. I'm sure somebody got him water or whatever because that's the type of situation where people die. Complaint says, Siler waived his Miranda rights, agreed to talk to investigators. And he said, He's paid a hundred bucks for each unauthorized immigrant he transported. He was expecting 50 people that night, but there were 77. So he was like, well, you know what? A hundred bucks a person. So he's going to make 7,700 bucks. 
It's quite a bit. What did I say weight wise? I got the weight wrong, didn't I? <laughs> oh man. I said eighty thousand pounds. Eight thousand pounds. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the van could carry that many. All right, so my scenario of all the weaving and stuff was off. Hey, I told you I'm a mathematician. <laughs> Oh, man, there were people. And, you know, look, you're just catching. I'm just catching it. And I noticed you're just catching it, too. So, but I know there were people out there going, Kevin, what kind of math are you doing, dude? (laughs) That's like 10 times the weight. Anyway, it was a lot of weight. So figure this, what, 15,000 pounds? Because you figure, uh, let's just average 100 people at 150 pounds, 15,000 pounds. And you know some of them were bigger. Yeah, there were five kids, but the rest of them were big. Look, I'm not going to argue with you. People don't want to hear us arguing on the radio. Anyway, there's a lot of weight. And uh, so I don't know what was making the guy weave or whatever, but the, apparently the truck was riding low to the ground. It didn't break an axle or anything with 80,000 pounds or 100, 150,000 pounds in it, but it was a lot of weight. Riding low to the ground. Riding dirty, too, as they say. And so he gets, gets these people caught. UPS said that Siler never worked for the company. The truck was not a real UPS vehicle. So Brown wanted to be out of it. And they are. They got nothing to do with it. But here's why. I think they let this dude go. I think they got a bigger fish. What do you what do you think? I bet you they got because you know, think about it. He went and he got out on bond, but they somehow the, the charges got dropped. I'm just telling you. He's going to be in witness protection because if, if it's like MS-13 or somebody bringing people over illegally, this dude's in trouble. He's in trouble. So he turned state's evidence because that's how he got out of this. Is If he's getting paid 100 bucks a head and he's going to make, you know, eight, what, 7,700 bucks, then somebody's making a lot more. Somebody's, if they're paying him a hundred, somebody's making a thousand, right? Somebody's making $77,000 to bring these people in, or more. I've heard coyotes charge 10 grand. And you know, the minute they got here, whew, families were, you know, they were going to spread them out. If this had been Obama, this dude, no, nobody would have been prosecuted. Anyway, I want to talk about this dreamer kid that was on TV the other day this kid is somebody we have to know his story is more important than i can even let you in on i hope i can convey that this is the kevin jackson radio show do you owe back taxes to the irs or state the secret to avoiding the irs nightmare is to seek professional representation my friends at security tax associates provide the most cost effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures levies and wage garnishments security tax associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all for a free no obligation consultation Contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. Kevin J. 
Jackson Radio Show. Happy Valentine's Day to you and yours. Smoke them if you got them. Is, is that the right saying for Valentine's Day? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. KJRadio.com. 844-551-8255. Big day for people out there with mates, spouses, or otherwise, whatever. LGBTQ, they celebrate Valentine's Day too, right? I mean, is there... Is, see, here's the thing about Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is a day for women. It used to be it was like a day where it was, I'm guessing, I, I did a thing on Valentine's Day a long time ago and I just hadn't really paid that much attention to it because it's a contrived day, right? It's a contrived day for lovers and people that you know want to showcase their whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, shouldn't you be doing that anyway? I mean, shouldn't you be caring? No, 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 Kevin. It's a concentrated day. You know, you do all those other things, but it's a concentrated day to make people understand how important they are. Okay. I think it's a concentrated day to sell a lot of flowers, to sell a lot of cards, and to, you know, spur a lot of dinners. And does it make people reflect on their relationships? Perhaps, but so do other things. You know, so do so does your anniversary. That's on a random day. You pick it. See, that's in, that's important because you pick that one. No, 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 not this one. The the people did it for you. And for guys, I'm not going to get all in your business, but, you know, it's kind of like that old, you know, engagement ring and wedding ring thing. Who gets holes? Who gets left holding the bag? Huh? Come huh? Come on, fellas. The guys, you get left holding the bag. You get the band. Mama gets the fat rock. Speaking of a fat rock, did you see Melania Trump? They did a picture of her and she was walking somewhere recently, elegant dress, and they had a picture of her hand and the rock on her hand. I mean, she'd have to do push-ups with her ring finger. I'm telling you, keep that rock on there. You got to be working that bad boy out, because <laughs> that'll tire. You have to take that booger off like at three, about two, three hours into the day, and give your finger a rest. Whoo, whoo. Yeah, that's the kind of rock where you say, okay, here's the deal. That's anniversaries, Valentine's Day, uh, you're mad at me days. That covers a lot of days. That booger was bad to the bone. I mean, if you're into that kind of thing. There are a lot of ladies out there just have the band like they're men. Good for you, ladies. What you're saying is, I don't need all that. I'd rather put that in my house. I'd rather put that in my car. I'd rather put that into my kids. I don't need that $40,000, $50,000 rock. Hey, if you're making that kind of coinage and you want to drop that kind, you know, that big of a load on a rock, good for you. You know, keep that capitalism moving. Just make sure it's not a blood diamond. But boy, most people, it's kind of like, I look at these wedding dresses and I'm thinking, you know, seriously? Brides going there with a budget. Yeah, my budget for my wedding dress is $15,000. And I'm like, that's the budget for like Haiti. You know, that, or it, really? I saw a girl. Oh, secret shame. Yeah, about to hear my secret shame. I was watching Say Yes to the Dress. By accident, it was on. And I watched a girl buy like an $80,000 wedding dress. I didn't what's in it is it is it woven with gold and and woven by angel what could this dress be this 80 grand i'm sorry oh kevin you don't know anything about winter you're right i don't i don't I put mine up years ago <laughs> and, and look i'm not trying to wait rain on people's parade i get it it's a big day you've been a little girl you've been groomed it's kind of a strange way to put it but you've been groomed to go for this big day and the big fat rock and the big expensive dress and a big expensive wedding and these weddings I saw a wedding that cost I, I think the dude probably dropped a mill I know I was in a wedding where the, the guy the uh, father dropped over a million dollars for his daughter's wedding Susan Mormon they had get this 14 wine in um, uh, what do they call it champagne stations and here's what it was y'all think I'm kidding but I'm not it was a wagon load of champagne with a donkey in a bear on a wagon hitched to a donkey. 14 locations around the ranch where they had these. And when I tell you that every one of those donkeys, uh, the, the wagons was loaded with champagne, I'm going to guess and say every one of those donkeys had a minimum 
of a hundred bottles of champagne in that dunk in that thing. I'm not talking cheap stuff. I remember when they were wiring up the lighting of the trees and Betty Mormon, Lou said to Betty, he goes, if I, if I had known how much it was going to cost for just wiring these trees, I might've not done that or something like that. It was, it was done at Greenwood farms, San Antonio, Texas. They had these little things that floated on a Olympic sized pool, little things that I didn't even know they made these, but they, they were little flower like things and they were candles and they floated on the pool as the wedding was going on. It was at dusk. They, uh, Susan comes in in this really beautiful carriage. She married John, a guy named John. And, um, you know, I don't know what her dress cost, but it was a fortune. And I heard, I heard that Lewis Mormon spent a million bucks for that wedding. I thought to myself, holy cow. Anyway, I don't know what, what's he spent on Valentine's day. What do you get? What do you get for somebody when you're their family's filthy rich? Lou has had some money. There's no question he came from money, but Betty was from big time money. Cause I knew her family quite well. What do you get her? Valentine's day. I was at a party with them. I mean, we served the party. I was working. Okay. For those of you who think I'm all snooty and sadity and bourgeois. No, I was working the party and the lady, the family that owned the Del Monte corporation, the heads were there. Mrs. Head had a diamond ring on and it was the biggest diamond ring I'd ever seen. Probably about the size of the one Melania wore. Because I said Melania, I saw that picture. I said they need to give Melania a midget that she can rest her hand on that midget's head when she's tired of carrying that rock around. You know what I'm saying? That is a big rock. See Mrs. Head, she sit over by the uh, window and near the patio. And I see that stone. I'm serving drinks. But I was like, whoa, Mrs. Head. Holy cow. I go, how big is that rock? Is that diamond? And she says to me, I've told this story before. She says to me, Kevin, it's impolite to ask a lady how big her rock is. You know, how big her stone is in her ring. And I said, oh, I apologize. I'm really sorry. You know, didn't know. Bad form. It's on me. My bad. Okay. And then she whispered to me, 10 carats, <laughs> 10 carats. And I'm not talking about one with a bunch of inclusions and bad color, 10 carats. And I can still see that ring in my mind's eye. That ring is it's probably worth more than what, what is a 10 carat well cut stone worth? I looked it up. I wanted to be sure. From sixteen thousand plus per carat to two hundred thousand dollars per carat, and you can bet your bottom dollar that Mrs. Head's diamond was in that upper range. A woman had two million dollars on her finger. That's just bizarre to me, right? It's a stone, and we put so much value into it. It's almost like Hollywood, right? We put so much value into people that have no real. What's their intrinsic value? Nothing. Happy Valentine's Day. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. I don't like the DACA part. I mean, I don't like the amnesty part. I don't believe we owe them anything, you know. They seem to believe just because they were brought over that that makes them a child of God, you know. The guy that murdered my son was brought over at three years old. He didn't stay three years old. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. That was Jamil Shaw Sr. And he's talking about the death of his son, Jamil Shaw, a promising young athlete killed by a an illegal, and as he as he's made pretty clear, an illegal who was brought over here under the DACA program, you know, made a DACA person, and everybody told, oh, they're so great, they're just under the law, they're good kids, and all they want is a chance. Yeah, well, not all of them. So, hey, let's finish that clip, because I think it's, it's powerful to hear Jamil Shaw. I've seen him in multiple uh, events, and it's important to understand his side of the story. 
You know, he had three gun charges. You know, his last one was assault with a deadly weapon, battery on a peace officer, and then they only gave him eight months in the county jail, let him out four months early. The same day he got out, he was back to murder. And so just because you were brought over and, you know, and then they say, you're, you know, the, uh, the sins of the, of the father on the kids. But what about the mom and dad? They bringing the kids over illegal. They're illegal. Nobody gets in trouble. And our family so, members are so dead. You- and when we complain, we're racist. Wow, that was powerful testimony. Powerful. He's so right, too. And this is a brother. You know, this, <laughs> not that it should make a difference, but I'm just saying, you know, when you look at black folks should be the most outraged. I'm not going to get in all the reasons because you are, you already know them. But uh, I want to get to this Hilario Yanez story in just a bit. But before we get to that, I really do want this part about these people, these dreamers that are threatening to leave the country. Have you have you heard about these guys um, threatening to leave the country if DACA is not passed? And go where? Where are you going to go? Yeah. Dreamers who are illegally in the country threatening to leave the country if no deal is made to keep them here. Let that sink in. I mean, these are not the brightest bulbs on in the box here. Where are you going to go? Michelle Malkin has this to say back in September in a Fox Business interview, and it's more relevant now than it was even then. She says the fact is that if you were a sing, if there were a single deserving dreamer in this country, they would be deserving because they would acknowledge that they are owed nothing, and that they deserve nothing from a country into which they were were born because of their parents' illegal activity. Then they weren't born here. They were brought here, is what I think she meant to say. She went on to say this. You can talk to anyone who's come into the country the right and proper way, including my own parents. There are many first and second generation Americans who understand that citizenship is a privilege, not a right. And when you have an entire class of 800,000 people who feel entitled to be here, despite the law, you're creating the very trouble we're in now. Michelle Malkin, my good friend, is one thousand percent right these kids that go and march carry their mexican flags in la and all over the country wherever they are and don't understand that you look we we get it many of us get it for those who haven't gotten it i would venture to tell you donald trump's done a pretty good job of making you understand you know what these are these are not circumstances that these kids brought on to themselves it would be different if if they had done it to go after their parents is, is certainly a vi- viable thing to do. But the idea that you have to look at these kids and say they're criminals, no, they're not. They are victims of their circumstances. And nobody's explaining that better than Donald Trump. Until I heard this kid, Hilario Yanez. This kid has it together. And I want to play the clip of him on Fox News, Fox and Friends the other morning. And I was going to cover this the other day when I saw that, when I saw his interview and I said, this kid deserves more time because what he said is a lot more poignant than you'll, than, than you'll glean out of an interview like that. So let's play the clip and then I'll talk about it. Who was brought to the United States from Mexico when he was only one years old and he joins us now. Welcome, Hilario. So good morning. How's it going? Good morning. So tell us what you like about the president's plan. Well, let me begin by first thanking Donald Trump for his leadership, his compassion, and also the courage to take on this issue. At the end of the day, uh, you know, he's a guy who wants to ha- provide a, uh, a pathway to citizenship for, for myself and really, you know, ha- make a difference in my life. So for that, I'm, a, I'm for that. I'm also, I believe we need to have border security so this doesn't happen again. Um, that's very important. And if a wall is necessary to add an extra layer for Border Patrol to do their job, in a safe and uh, responsible matter, then, you know, I think it's necessary to fund it. Uh, the last uh, couple of points is the diversity lottery. I think it, it's, it's outdated. I think it's time for uh, people who want to come to the United States to, to focus, uh, to, for us to focus on skills so that they can contribute to the uh, American economy right away. Uh, at the very end, the Republicans are in a unique position to really lead on this and really uh, provide immigration reform that's long overdue. Ilaria, what do you make of the way Democrats have postured on this then? You know, talking about dreamers, saying they're their advocates, but ultimately tying it to budget gimmicks and, and floor speeches. 
Look, so, you know, three points that I want to make about that. Number one, the Democratic leadership, Nancy Pelosi and, and Chuck Schumer, uh, really uh, have no clear message, uh, have been, you know, we have been confused. I think at the end of the day, they've been using us as pawns. The second point that I want to bring is that they should have never shut down the government over DACA. We should have never held our American people and our military hostage. There's plenty of uh, time uh, on the table to fix this. March 5th is the deadline. And you can see Republicans already uh, 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 willing to do something about it as we speak. And the last thing, point that I want to say is that, look, Democrats, they own all three branches of the government back in 2008 to 2011, and they still chose to do anything. So at this point, I'm quite Great frustrated point. with the Democratic leadership, what they've done. Holy smokes, right? Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. Hilario Yanez, don't be surprised if this kid goes rocketing through the Republican Party. Don't be surprised if he becomes a solid advocate of Republican values, conservative values and stuff like that. And by the way, I got another clip we'll play for him. We're not going to do it this section because I got to play. I want to discuss what he talked about. The first thing this kid did was to thank Trump for his leadership, compassion and courage. Wow. Goosebumps. Then he went on to talk about the the Trump policies that were going to stop people like him from having to have that fear come to this country legally. So he says border wall, border security, get a wall, protect the border patrol agents, get rid of the diversity lotto lotto. He says it was outdated. He says it should be we should focus on skills that will let people contribute right away. But what he said that was the most important part of this whole thing. Republicans are in a unique position. Think about this. The Republicans have the ability to steal something from the Democrats, something that the Democrats don't want for the right reasons. This kid understands that the Democrat Democrats, he said, have no clear message. And in fact, they're confusing dreamers. They're making it was the push and pull. We're going to get you here. No, we're not. We're going to get you here. No, we're not. These kids wanting to come out of the shadows, wanting to live the American dream and then being used as pawns. And that was his words. Then he goes on to say this. The Democrats shouldn't have used us as pawns to shut down the government, which builds animosity to the taxpayers. Now, he didn't say that. He says they shouldn't hold the taxpayers hostage. Using us is the pawns. Using us is the is the fuel. They're pitting the American people against us. And all we want is to come out of the shadows and be legit. And he got it. And then when he says if they would wanted to get this accomplished, and this is let me tell you. I don't know how many you know Latinos or other kids are going through this, but it or if they feel this way. But this kid got it, and he says if they'd wanted to get it done, they had all three branches of government, and they did nothing. All they've done is frustrate us. Back to the Republicans. He recognizes the Republicans have offered to do this. They want to do it. See, that was the dirty little secret. In the past, everybody would pretend to want to do it and do nothing because it was a convenient little thing to kick the can down the road here. Everybody now knows Trump will get it done, period. And you can't, there's no more hostage holding of the American people or Donald Trump on it. He's I saw one cartoon where they had Chuck Schumer painting the floor black as he was painting himself into a corner. And I thought, and it, it said DACA in the corner. And it was so true. It was so fitting. Well, it's exactly what's happened. The Mexican kids know Republicans want to legalize you. Why are you marching against Donald Trump? Why are you afraid of Donald Trump? He has said, I don't want to legalize 800,000 of you. I'll, I'll legalize the 1.6 million of you or 1.8 million who are hiding in the shadows. I'll legalize all of you. But... Here's what we're going to get. And these kids that are here are going, God bless this man. We got more in a minute. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. 
My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Before we go back to Hilario, the dreamer, who has just <laughs> explained that the Democrats are in big trouble on DACA and the Republicans now have the, op- the, the ability to become the savior of the Mexicans, the ones who are here illegally because of their parents and want to get out of the shadows, and the Republicans are going to become known for the ones who've done it let me tell you what the, that's what the Democrats are struggling to come up with right now. But before we get back to that, because I want to play the second part of this guy's this kid's talk on Fox News that just had me at hello. You know, I feel like I was in in a Jerry Maguire. You know what I mean? You had me at hello, Hilario. <laughs> Mucho gusto, mi amigo. You know, but I want to play. <laughs> I want to play Joe Walsh, California uh, legislator talking to his group about illegal immigration. And this is a great speech. And we'll play the second Hilario when we come back from that. Well, after I talk about Joe a little bit, because he delivers this in such a great way. You got to see, <coughs> pardon me, if you get a chance, I hope you get a chance to see it because it's even better. Here's a clip. It amazes me that a sovereign nation allows millions and millions and millions and millions of people to come in illegally. This issue more than anything put Trump in the White House. We cannot be living with a different set of facts. Uh, The crime rate among illegals in this country far surpasses. False. Far surpasses. Chewy, That's a lie. if I'm false, I'll move into it's your false. district and I'll vote for you. Show three, some evidence. No way. According okay. to our Show own some government. some evidence. Let me, let me finish and then yep. fire at me. According to our own government, the Department of Justice, the FBI, illegals make up 3.5% of the population of this country. 30% of the murders in this country are committed by illegals. Illegals make up 3.5% of this country. 75% of all federal drugs drug offense convictions are committed by illegals. I'm going to say it again. Illegals make up 3.5% of this country. 17% of all drug trafficking convictions are committed by illegals. According again to the U.S. Sentencing Commission and the GAO, illegals are 3.5 times more likely to commit murder than a natural born American and a legal American. I'm going to throw one more at you, Chewy. Two-thirds Two-thirds of all outstanding felony warrants in the city of Los Angeles are for illegals. 95% of all outstanding warrants for murders in Los Angeles are for illegals. Stop, my friend. I love you. But it's not even close. The crime rate, the murder rate, the rape rate, the drug offense rape for people in this country illegally far surpasses the natural born population. And last point, far surpasses legal immigrants. When we talk about this topic, sanctuary cities, what are we going to do for people in this country illegally? We always forget about people who are here legally. We always forget about those people in a line trying to get into this country legally. We always forget to talk about them. Wow. Powerful too, right? Welcome back. Kevin Jackson here. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. 844-551-8255. So Joe Walsh giving you the numbers and the guy, that's nonsense. And then Joe goes, hey, here it is. DOJ, FBI. Don't believe me. Go look it up. 
go look it up. What is so difficult for these people? Let me let me tell you what it is. They get told that this is the way it is and they are lazy. Leftists are inherently lazy. They aren't going to look it up. They're going to believe what the left to hear are the talking points to refute whatever they say. Did you look at those? No. Did you fact check it at all? No. J- no. I'm just going to repeat it. And then a guy like Joe Walsh goes, no, I went to the FBI, the statistics and looked it up. 30 percent in a 3.5 percent of the population, 30 percent of the murders. So get putting this in perspective, 3 percent of the black population commits 70 percent. I mean, I'm sorry, 50 percent of the murders between 6.5 percent of the population, illegals and black teens, uh, 80 percent of the murders in this country are committed. Now, that's ridiculous. But you can't say anything about either one of them. You, they don't want to tell you that it's, you know, Pedro Garcia or Jaquan McDonald that did whatever. They just want to oh, gloss over it and, and make you believe that you're safe when you are in, in, you know, involved with any of these people. 3.5% of the population, 30% of the murders. Illegals, too. I mean, not that I'm going to break it out and say, well, at least the black folk killing people illegal. Care. Y'all, I mean, you can look at it that way. I don't care whether you're legal or you're illegal. You shouldn't be killing people. But you doggone don't want somebody coming over here and killing people. Seventy five percent of all federal drug convictions are illegals. So when Donald Trump says they're bringing their drugs and doing the drug, what do you think? He's, he's just just pulling that out of thin air, right? Yeah, because he's stupid. He's unhinged. The warden grad who took a million dollars and made it into billions is unhinged. He doesn't know. He can't look at statistics. What's he ever done in his miserable life? 17% of all drug trafficking convictions. That is almost five times the amount of the people who are here and oh by the way here's another little interesting stat if you took the 3.5 percent of illegals and you boiled it down to the number of them that are actually doing the crimes it would really get scary because as the left will tell you the overwhelming number of these people are good people so let's say 80 percent of them are good people you follow if 80 percent of them are good people of the 3.5%, that means less than 1% of these people are doing all of these things that we're talking about. They're 3.5% more likely to commit murder than a regular person. That's who you want running around here? Two thirds of all outstanding federal warrants in LA are illegals. For all intents and purposes, that that is a city, a sanctuary city run by nothing but illegals. Ninety five percent of all outstanding felony warrants for murder in L.A. are for illegals. What more do you need to hear? Anyway, let's hear the rest of uh, Hilario's testimony. Hilario, I read your story. It's very impressive. Why don't you tell our viewers a little bit um, about your story so they understand where you're coming from? Yeah, so pretty much I came in the U.S., you know, when I was a year old, you know, I I grew up as a child. I at one point I was homeless. You know, I grew up without a father in my life and also grew up in a rough neighborhood. But the the reason I was over over able to overcome these challenges is because of the conservative values that I grew up with. And that's number one, my faith in God. You know, I believe in Jesus Christ, my savior. Number two is my family. I also believe in value, prosperity, hope, and also working hard and standing on your own two feet. And look, at the end of the day, I would, I, you know, when I hear the national anthem, I get goosebumps all over me. I, I would I always, I always play, uh, pledge allegiance to the flag, and I would never disrespect it. I would never take a knee, and I would do anything uh, to serve this country, to die for this country. And, you know, all, all, all I need is a chance. Wow, man. Woo. If you, I don't know what your feelings are about dreamers and all that, but you hear that kid, he he could be a spokesperson for dreamers. He should be the one that the Republicans bring on and say, you're going to go into schools and you're going to talk to these Hispanic kids about what it means to be an American. He's more American than any Democrat serving in Congress that I know. I'd sponsor him. I'd adopt him. 
I'd get a girl to marry him. Whatever it takes to get Hilario into America is what I'll do. I will be the darn king of being a Hilario into America. Only in America, baby. <laughs> I mean, that kid, did, did, come on, what did that do for you? I will die for this country. I want to be a part of this country. Give me a chance. See, I train kids like him in martial arts. Now, look, in another sports too, but I'm saying mostly martial arts. This is a kid that wants it. Now, I'm not going to tell you every kid that's in DACA is this way. They're not. They've been indoctrinated to be leftists. But when they have to go through, and this is what I keep coming back to, DACA is going to backfire on the left big time. Number one, it already has. It will be Donald Trump's deal. It is no longer going to be a Democrat thing. It's going to belong to the Republicans and it's going to be Donald Trump. And that's going to make lots of Hispanics go, I mischaracterize this man. I, they told me he's xenophobic. Think about this. People pay attention. They, they said that Donald Trump hates Mexicans. Remember how they pitted him against that Mexican judge and all this? And Donald Trump says, no, I don't, I don't want to just bring 800,000 of them. I want 1.8 million or whatever the number is. And now people, well, he wants more. And then you got guys like Hilario who understand it. These people are in trouble. Ooh, I love this. He won't stop until he's the top rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Yeah, Democrats have a pretty weak, feckless, and ineffective bench there. If you want to put up Eric Holder, please do so. He's a radical leftist. Uh, he's corrupt. He led a corrupt Justice Department that imperiled American citizens. So please, Democrats, we would love that. Bring it. Bring on Holder. Welcome, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. KJRadio.com. The, the idea that Eric Holder has a legitimate shot at being president is so ridiculous. I put it up there with Rosie O'Donnell becoming, you know, being on the cover of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition in 2018. Whoopi Goldberg becoming a Victoria's Secret model. You get what I'm saying. It is not going to happen. The Democrats are embroiled in controversy. They are stunned right now. I talked the other day about their shock, shock and awe. They're stunned. I mean, forget the the obvious. We never thought we would be in this position because Donald Trump was never supposed to be president. We know because we know the fix was in. We are looking at all the different ways that these scoundrels try to maneuver and think about what they covered up. Hillary Clinton getting millions of dollars, one hundred and forty five million dollars for the sale of uranium to our arch enemy, the very people she claims Donald Trump's working against, I mean, working with, she's working with, gets, uh, I mean, it's, there's, this isn't even in dispute that Hillary received $145 million from the Russians by way of their crooked foundation, this racketeering organization known as the Clinton Foundation, and we aren't even discussing it. Now, I get it. We got them on the ropes. We got all kinds of other things moving, moving forward. But you know what? In shock and awe, you have to keep the pressure on in all fronts. This is why I'm imploring you guys to look at the, the Tea Party Community dot org. Tea Party Community dot org. And for you chumps out there going, Kevin, I don't know about the Tea Party name. I say to you, what have they done? They killed any cops? Have they uh, done any terrorist acts like Antifa? Or Muslim terrorists. What have they done except go somewhere, march peacefully, leave the place cleaner than it was. They've never threatened politicians or anything except at the ballot box. And you're afraid to represent them. Well, good for you. Because if you if that's your feeling, you're a coward. Hate to put it this way, but we don't need you. This movement no longer needs cowards. We need people willing to stand up. What has the Tea Party done that you are so embarrassed about? Except change your government. Is that what you're embarrassed about? Are you embarrassed that you helped elect the only honest president that we've had since Reagan? Are you upset that you've elected a guy who took 
the venerable Ronald Reagan, this is tough to say, and surpassed him year one and is well on his way to doing it for another year? What exactly are you embarrassed about? That he isn't presidential enough? What? What's what's got you? Because let me tell you something. If you ever attended a Donald Trump gala or you've been anywhere with him, he's not an embarrassment. The only embarrassment he is is that people on the left will try to make you believe that he's gauche. He's too gaudy. The very people who have run to him for campaign contributions before he ran, they were all over the guy. This is the guy that gets things done. And you, as a member of the Tea Party community, can do the same thing. This is not about joining a social media group and then communicating with friends all day and going, oh, good, I found my buddy or we did this. This is about you getting off your butts and going out and doing something. Let me explain to you what happens when you do something. You feel good. You ever done? I mean, look, I'm not going to get into it because I want to do this as a separate call it a sermon. But if you've ever done anything in your life where maybe you promised you said, oh, I'm going to go help my buddy, you know, um, build his, uh, you know, maybe you've done something in Habitat for Humanity or some sort of a, of a cause. We, you know, we've got all kinds of charitable things that we've done. And so when you you look at my team, you may have committed your Saturday to go do something at, at say, the Salvation Army. I did one day. I had to go clean. Uh, I didn't know what they'd have me do. But when I got there, I had to clean these filters. And these filters were filthy. It was the worst job. You had to wear a mask and it was black soot. It was crazy. And the guy told me, he says, man, Kev, it takes a long time. He goes, I, I said, just give me your worst job. The one you don't want to do. He goes, the filters. Okay. Took a ladder. He showed me how to do one. I went, wow, why did I volunteer for this? But everywhere I went, I was in a men's dorm and there were guys around and I'm looking in their eyes, thinking to myself there, but by the grace of God, go I. There, but by the grace of God, go I. And I'm watching these sad men away from their families, away from their kids, away from their friends, away from people they love, down and out for whatever reason, all kinds of reasons. And I went to the next place and I struck up a conversation, you know, here and there. How you doing, man? Oh, good. I'd see. What's your name? I'm Calvin. Hey, Calvin. I'm Kevin. Whatever. What's your name? I'm Ben. Ben, good to talk to you. Cleaning the things. And they would tell me, oh, man, those are terrible to clean. I was like, you doggone right, man. Cleaning. And I get finished. I'm there, I don't know, four hours or so. And I go to the guy I'm cleaning. He's like, you got them all done? All done, man. I'm full of soot and all this. I got my mask is practically, but it's gray. And, um, you know, and I, and about, I'm seeing these guys. And so I said, Hey, by the way, I got these things in my car. I'm going to bring it. These little soaps. I get, I used to collect them from the still do from hotels. And I delivered those to him and said, if any of the guys are going to be, you know, getting out and, and they don't want to carry a bunch of stuff, here's enough stuff to get them clean for, you know, a couple of days. And they go, Kevin, we so thank you for these, you know, that, and that was what it was. So as much as you don't want to go initially, when you go and you see these people and you talk to them and you th- and it, it, it gives you a reset. It makes you understand, you know what? It doesn't matter what I'm going to go face in the next day, in the next week, in the next month. I'm not them. And it, I'm not saying it in a bad way. Like, I'm not them. Thank God. I'm saying I'm not them except by the grace of God. Holy cow. The point is, If you get off your butt and you do something, you feel good. You may not want to go at first, but you feel good. That's what Tea Party community is about. It is political church because the there's no difference between conservative and Christian conservative in my book. You may be Jewish conservative, but I'm saying you're a biblical conservative and you want to help. And it is not about talk. And the quicker you get over there and you join the quicker we can start doing more things together. I can't do this by myself. And you know what? I'm tired of doing it by myself. Go to the website, KJ Radio, find out where to donate, donate and help. And if you don't have the money, fine, donate your time. There's more ways to help this movement. And it isn't about some ideological thing. It is about what we should be doing because it's God's work. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. 
My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. So, when this Russian plane crashed, I'll be honest with you, I didn't think much of it planes crash and the reason why i didn't think much of it i've never been to the soviet union and um but friends of mine were there and they said oh my gosh kevin we took a flight from moscow to kiev or something i don't know uh honestly don't remember where but you know somewhere within russia and they said it was harrowing and the number of russian planes that crashed they said we'll never fly inside of russia again and i was like well you know how often are you going to go I mean, it was my thought, but they said they had a great time. It was really, you know, a surreal experience in many ways, but it wasn't. This was a few years back. So when I heard a plane had crashed, I was like, well, they don't have the standards that we have. They don't have the, you know, and I hate to make the government sound like they really do such a good job here, but we don't have a whole lot of plane crashes. So I'll give the FAA some credit on that. And as much as I don't feel safe, you know, going through TSA, I think it's a, a waste of time. I, you know, th- there's not a whole lot that happens at the airport. So when I heard this plane had crashed and, and having traveled a lot in, you know, around the world and seen how some of these not, you know, I'm not talking about China or Japan and places like that where they've got the safest, you know, their airlines are as safe as ours. But I'm talking about some of these third world countries where you're like, whoa, you know, it's, it's puddle jumpers and, you know, bat, these things are like, da, 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 you know, you, you just wonder, you question your the safety and the, the record keeping and things like that. But I didn't think anything of it. And then I start getting this co- these conspiratorial emails around this Russian uh, plane crash. And then uh, this guy writes, as Russian authorities released passenger names on the official death list, several of those now deceased names raised immediate red flags because they appear to be directly connected to Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Uranium One conspiracy, and the fake Russian dossier used to smear President Trump. Now that they've been caught, it appears that many in the deep state are cleaning house and getting rid of any loose ends who might testify. Sergei Millenian, a Belarus-born businessman who briefly worked with the Trump administration and was reportedly a key source in the explosive dossier alleging ties between Donald Trump and Russia was in the spotlight following the release of testimony before the House Intelligence Committee. Glenn Simpson, who co-founded the opposition research firm Fusion GPS, told lawmakers that a trip Trump organization representatives took to Moscow several years ago had come under the firm's radar as part of their research 
into Trump's business history. Trip was organized by Sergey Millennium. Simpson said, he said Millennium came up in connection with Chris's work as one of the people around Trump who had a Russian background. Chris is a reference to Christopher Steele, former British intelligence officer hired by Fusion to research Trump's Russia ties. This Russian businessman, Sergei Millennium, goes by another name, Sergei Panchenko. Sergei Panchenko just happens to be one of the dead passengers in the Russian crash to kill 71 people. Also dead in the crash is Ivanov, and I, I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name, but it looks like Ev- Ev- Chof- 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 Cheslov, I don't know how to say that name, CFO of Rosatom, which is involved in Hillary's Uranium One deal with the Russians back in 2009 under Barack Obama. There are other names on the list which correspond to other persons in Uranium One and in high-level Russian government circles such as oil and, and energy development. These names are being verified and additional news stories will be published with them. But they said for now, two people known to be directly involved with Uranium One and the Russian dossier are now apparently dead. Can't testify to tell anybody anything. Happenstance? Convenience? What? Now, I don't know. But I will tell you this. The Clintons have a strange way of having a lot of friends and acquaintances die in really crazy ways. Particularly plane crashes. Ron Brown, who they said was about to blow the lid on some shenanigans of the Clintons, his plane flew into a mountain in Africa. Now, again, coincidence? Possibly. But I, t- I would say to Clinton's friends, you better be very careful right now. And I know, folks, it seems like it's a joke, right? Oh, come on, Kevin. Do people really kill each other over? St- Guys, look, I'm going to point to Hollywood. And I'm going to tell you, they don't have any imagination. Hollywood is killing people in movies for reasons like this because it happens. What's that movie with Will Smith where the guy's a, he's a bird watcher and he sets up his camera in a hide and he captures somebody from the CIA killing a congressman or a senator. And he goes to get his camera and people are like, oh my gosh, that camera would have captured everything So then they go after him. And that's the end of it. It's that simple. It's that quick. Now, in this particular case, uh, we've got people that were going to testify against the Clintons with this uh, Haiti deal. And the Clinton Foundation, literally days before testimony, before the U.N. or whatever, mysteriously, they die. It is the most uncanny thing. Here's what you should probably do. You should say, you should put it out there that I'm going to be testifying in six months. And then you testify that day. If you want any chance of survival, because if you, if the closer that that day looms, that you're going to be testifying against the Clintons, get an insurance policy that kicks in right away. Because these people seem to be notorious and apparently have a lot of reach. I'll put it to you this way. Do you think Donald Trump, and I don't know if this happened. I don't know if this is legit or not. I don't. I'm telling you right now, it could be the biggest amount of coincidence ever. But I'll ask you this. Do you believe if Donald Trump had some shenanigans going on that he could reach into Russia and say to Vladimir, hey, listen, these people are trying to get me. Uh, you know my back's against the wall. Can you make a plane go down? And Vladimir, I take care. Of, I'll take care for you. I take care for you. You owe me. You will owe me, but I will take care for you. You, you think he could have? I don't believe Trump has that kind of clout. I'm saying if he had lost the election and that was what was going on, I don't know what Hillary has over people. I don't know about old Barack Obama's database that he has over people. But these people were not into in the politics. So they could play it on the up and up. These are the people that got NSA and people involved and they know 
what's going on. They know how to ruin people in their countries. They got black book on lots of folks. If you think Hillary Clinton didn't say, I want all the data on all these bad guys. So when I go into a negotiation, I know exactly how to grab them by the yang yangs and make sure we get what we want. Not America, the Clinton foundation and Barack Obama authorized it. And he said, you know, give me my big database. So when I leave, I've got the same opportunity. Crooks all. This is the Kevin Jackson radio show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. What's up, everybody? Kevin Jackson here. Two more DOJ FBI investigators implicated in FBI text quit. Welcome to the Kevin Jackson Show, KJRadio.com, where we break it down for you. I've been talking about the hustle. I've been talking about trust. I talk about a lot of concepts. Things that you've learned over time, conservatives, things that you've taken to heart, that you have put as your, the center of your being. This is your chi, to use Chinese terminology. That's where all your strength comes together in your body. They call it center of mass, center of gravity. Call it whatever you want. It is a play. It is a reason why your body functions as it does. And you know that body is an amazing thing. The human body is probably God's greatest creation. You're going, what are you talking about, Kev? We've got nuclear weapons. We've got spaceships. We got No, we got all that. Why? Because of the human body. Because of your brain. Your physiology would blow your mind. Do you know this? You probably don't even know this. Man is one of the few animals that can run over 20 miles without stopping. One of the few. You would think, who's the fastest animal to run a marathon? And you would go, a horse. Nope. A horse would have to stop and drink water and rest. A man is probably going to beat that horse. I know you you don't believe me. Google it. Find out how many animals can run 26 miles nonstop. Wolves don't do it. Hyenas don't do it. Very few animals can beat a man in in a marathon. You are an amazing amount of physiology. And don't even go into intellect. We marvel when we can get a parrot to count or, you know, a cat to to do something crazy or a dog to do tricks. Man, man is amazing. We do all that stuff. But you know what you're most amazing at? Discerning the nonsense. Weeding through the BS. They say animals have it. Oh, an animal can sense when you're such and such and such and such. Good for them. They're still food for us. But a human being can ferret you out. And that's what we've done, conservative Americans. Down to your core, you understand things. And that's why special prosecutor Robert Mueller is going to eventually shut down this stupid investigation. Because he's going to run out of rats. Two more senior officials prominently discussed in text messages exchanged by FBI personnel formally assigned to the Trump-Russia investigation are leaving their positions. 844-551-8255 if you do happen to want to call the show from time to time. We'd love to hear from you. Mike Cortan, FBI Assistant Director for Public Affairs. (laughs) What about private affairs? (laughs) Did Lisa Page... And Peter Strzok register with this man, or or do I just have his his uh, his a uh, wrong idea of what he does? Mike Cortans, the FBI assistant director for public affairs, he's retiring. An FBI spokesperson confirmed this, so we may or may not know that. In addition, the chief of the Justice Department's counterintelligence and export control section. David Lofman resigned last week. Mm-hmm. I was on a, what, Thursday or Friday of last week? 
Lofman, 59 years old, helped oversee the controversial probes of Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server and Russian interference in the 2016 election. Now you say, Kevin, why are you telling me this about 59-year-old David Lofman? Why are you telling me what he had to do with Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server and a Russian interference in the 2016 election? He was involved. I'll tell you this. Given all that we've learned by these, about these probes, you might be surmising right about now that Lofman is trying to get out while he can still get his pension. 2014 was a year that Lofman became the chief of the National Security Division's Counterintelligence and Export Control Section. But now he's gone, or about to be. And here's what he did. He said, I'm leaving for personal reasons. And then he resigned. It's a tough mission. It's a tough to leave a mission as compelling in an institution as exceptional as the Department of Justice. But I know that prosecutors and agents will continue to bring their work precise to their work, precisely what the American people should expect. A fierce and relentless commitment to protect the national security of the United States. This from a member of the Department of Justice who let Hillary Clinton off the hook after we now know with un. I mean, not without a doubt that Hillary Clinton had secrets on her personal computer server in her email and also on Anthony Weiner's laptop. But they're committed to the national security of the United States. Oh, hey, just as an aside, I don't know if you're going to factor this into anything, any way you want to view Lofman. This is up to you. But he did donate to both of Barack Obama's presidential campaigns. I know that probably comes as a shock to you, but he did. He was one of the Department of Justice holdovers. So what that means is he was a swamp rat. And for those who question the witch hunt by the Obama administration, still claiming legitimacy for the effort, I want you to note the number of departures that we've had. Former FBI Special Agent Josh Campbell recently quit the Bureau to join CNN because he's going to run cover as the fake news CNN tries to offer to you, the American people, that the FBI are the good guys. Yeah, they didn't do anything wrong. Why are you blaming them? Why is you? Why are, are the American people? Y'all thought I was going to get all ethnic, didn't you? Why is you? Why is you doing this? <laughs> I know how to use verb tense, America, pe- American people. <laughs> Yeah, but (laughs) now I'm laughing. The fact is, CNN's a joke. Josh Campbell's going over there and he claims, oh, you know, I felt the pressure. There was so much criticism being waged at the agency and rightfully so. Here's what he wrote in the New York op-ed. To be effective, the FBI must be believed and must maintain the support of the public it serves. These political attacks on the Bureau must stop. I'll tell you what, Josh Campbell, the political attacks on the Bureau will stop when the Bureau stops doing the shenanigans it has been doing. And if that sounded familiar, not what I said, what Josh Campbell said, they got to stop attacking us. It's relentless what they're doing. It's unfair. If it sounds familiar, folks, it's because it's Democrat talking points. That's all it is. But what about these other high-level resignations? Andy McCabe, Andrew McCabe, Andy, everybody, Andy. He stepped down on January the 29th, acting director of the Bureau, the guy who was going to leave in March to get his full retirement. But then, oh, well, poor Andy decided he better get out early. If he's going to get any retirement, he better get out early and claim it and get his family taken care of, get his ducks in a row, get things in order because Andy is going to go to prison. By the way, where's my buddy Carl? Carl, seriously, call the show. Get back with me, man, because I told you people are going to start. The heads are going to fall. Here's what I told everybody. I said this is going to all end up pointing back to Obama. I wrote a piece on this that said all roads lead to Barack Obama. And people were like, Kevin, the comments were, Kevin, man, I don't know, man. They never, nothing ever happens to him, man. I mean, I just feel like this. That. And then Carl wrote me a note. By the way, I like Carl. 
and, and he says, Kevin, same thing. What do you, you think is going to happen, broski? And I'm like, Carl, people are going to go down. And then Carl wrote me another note, and he says, Kevin, I'll be happy to say it when it happens. Now, I know he's, he's not, it, it hasn't happened yet. So Carl doesn't have to say anything, but he and I both know he's feeling a lot. You know, this is one of those deals where even if Carl loses, he's going to feel good, right? You're going to feel good. If Carl loses, he will gladly call the show or write to me and say, dude, you were right, Kevin. You be the man up in this mug because he's going to say you called it. And I did call it. I'm telling you exactly what's happening. I've been giving you the play by play since November the 8th of 2016. Actually, a long time before that. We've got people leaving left and right, folks. 2018 is year two of exposed the Democrat crooks, and it's the worst year ever for this party, and you're just getting started. You're barely through January. I know I had to get a little ethnic with you just to reinforce how upset I am at you right now. I'm going to keep you updated as these rats jump ship, and I'm going to update you as the news tightens around the many D.C. Democrats next, including Barack Obama, because it is coming. You're going to believe me. I predicted Trump would give the Democrats enough rope to hang themselves, and they unwittingly obliged. And I love the fact that we're using a hanging net of metaphor here, because it's making some people uncomfortable. Back in a bit. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. I can protect our country at many levels. This guy thought he was super agent James Bond at the FBI. This is obvious. I'm afraid we can't take that risk. We can't. There's no way we can let the American people make Donald Trump the next president. I got to protect our country. This is unbelievable. And I'm here to tell you, Mr. Rosenstein, I think the public trust in this whole thing is gone. Here, here, Jim Jordan. Kevin Jackson, who you're listening to, folks. Kevin Jackson Show, KJRadio.com, 844-551-8255. Jim Jordan asking Rosenstein, what should be the next steps? He's trying to figure out what, 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 we need a second, the next special counsel, don't you think? Let's listen to the rest of the clip, and then I'm going to get into what's happening with Mike Flynn, Michael Flynn, General Flynn. New developments there. Well, not so new, but hey, we got a lot of news to cover, and I wish we could cover it all as as it happens, but it's just too much. But the good news is it's good news for us. Let's play that clip. So it seems to me you got two things you can do. You're the guy in charge. You're the guy who picked Mueller. You're the guy who wrote the memo saying why he needed to fire Comey. You're the guy in charge. You could disband the Mueller special prosecutor, and you can do what we've all called for. Appoint a second special counsel to look into this, to look into Peter Strzok, Bruce Orr, everything else we've learned in the last several weeks. Yes, Congressman, and uh, I can assure you that I consider it very important to make sure the thorough review is done. Uh, and our inspector general is doing a thorough review. That's how we found those text messages as part of that review. Let me, you've, said, you've given that answer like 15 times. Let me ask you this. Are you concerned? I mean, this is what a lot of Americans are believing right now, and I certainly do. That the Comey FBI and the Obama Justice Department worked with one campaign to go after the other campaign. That's what everything points to. Think about what we've learned in the last several weeks. 
We, we first learned they paid for the dossier. Then we learned about Peter Strzok. And last week we learned about Bruce Orr and his wife, Nellie. I mean, this is unbelievable. So what's it going to take to get a second special counsel to answer these questions and find out, was Peter Strzok really up to what I think he was? I, I think it's important to understand, Congressman, we have an inspector general who has 500 employees and a $100 million budget. Uh, and this is what he does. He investigates allegations of misconduct involving department employees. That review that he is conducting is what turned up those text messages. It will also involve interviews of those persons and of other witnesses. And we're looking forward to his report, and we've met with Mr. Horowitz, and we're anxiously awaiting that report. But that doesn't dismiss the fact that the country thinks we need a second special counsel. Twenty members of this committee, the Judiciary Committee, with primary jurisdiction over the Justice Department, thinks we need a second special counsel. All kinds of senators think we need a special counsel. <coughs> what fact pattern do you have to have? What kind of text message do you have to see before you say it's time for a second special counsel? Jim Jordan grilling Rosenstein, and rightfully so. I want to move on. I want to talk about... Uh, General Mike Flynn in March of 2017, then FBI director James Comey briefed a number of Capitol Hill lawmakers on the Trump Russia farce. The the article said investigation. I added farce. One topic of intense interest was a case of Michael Flynn, the Trump White House national security advisor who resigned under pressure on February 13th, just 24 days into the job. There were widespread reports that Flynn had lied to Vice President Mike Pence about telephone conversations that he, Flynn, had with the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kislyak, during the transition late December 2016. And on January 24th of 2017, two of Comey's FBI agents went to the White House to question Flynn. There was speculation later that Flynn lied in that interview, which would be a serious crime. You know what's funny? When I heard this, I remember thinking to myself, this is no big deal. Why are they constantly... he, He... a White House is talking to another country and it's in whatever form or fashion, the Russian ambassador, if you're national security council, trust me, you're going to be interfacing with the Russians. We've been playing cat and mouse with them in spy games for decades. What's the big deal? Now, I don't know why Flynn would have said, no, I didn't. Or maybe I did. Maybe he didn't recollect. I don't know. But to me, it was a no-brainer. I, if I'd been talking to the Russians, I would have said, "Yeah, I, I think I maybe had one or two conversations with them." Sure, yeah. Well, could I say what it's about? No, it's none of your business. You're, you're, it's not. It's below your pay grade, FBI agent or not. You can't. I'm not going to tell you what I said. I, I, I never understood what this was about. They said this tw- January 24th interview potentially puts Flynn in legal jeopardy, uh, lying to the FBI as a federal offense. I can't imagine that a three-star general with the level of confidence you would have to be a three-star general that you would be intimidated with FBI. Come, I'll put it to you this way. I'm not a three-star general. I, I'm a relative nobody. If the FBI is asking me questions about what I did two days ago, I'm going to answer. And I'll say this again for the people that keep telling me, Kevin, Donald Trump shouldn't talk to the FBI or talk to Mueller because they're just going to twist him up. I'm going, that is the biggest farce it's the biggest bunch of nonsense i've ever heard in my life i could talk to the fbi 100 times about something that i did and i guarantee you 100 out of 100 i come out innocent kevin did you collude with the russians to get hillary clinton you know to keep hillary clinton from being you know the president of the united states no but i colluded with a lot of americans (laughs) that i did oh yeah (laughs) Yeah, I admit to that. Oh, they just got you. No, they didn't. They didn't give me for anything. I they asked me did I collude with the Russians? Nope. But I colluded with a bunch of Americans. And you know what? We won. We sure did. We kept that chick. We kept her little fat behind up in Chappaqua or wherever she lives because she should never be president of the United States. And and by the way, just to add this to your investigation, I hope there were people colluding with the Russians. Yeah, because she doesn't need to be elected. You should be ashamed of yourselves for even if somebody colluded to keep Hillary Clinton out, you should be thanking them. You should be looking for them to give them a medal. That's what I would have said. I'm trying to talk. Tell me it's intimidating to talk to you. It's not intimidating to talk to the government. I'm talking to my I'm talking to my employees. FBI shows up here. Hey, fellas, how y'all doing? They treating you okay up there? You should be sure to let me know. 
Because you know what I'll do? I'll let my thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people understand what you guys are going through. That's my role. Now, how can I help you fellas? Well, Kevin, there's an impropriety. Well, really? Well, then I tell you what, you do your due diligence and keep me posted and let me know if anybody's bothering you up there. I'll see y'all later. Thanks for checking in, employees. We don't work for them. I'm not intimidated by them. Intimidated by the IRS. For what? I file my taxes the right way. Don't cheat. Here's a, here they are. I mean, I don't make enough money to be worried about cheating. And even if I did, I wouldn't. Because my answer has always been with taxes is make enough to not worry about it. You know what I mean? Even at 40% tax break, 39.5, I was that years ago. I just tell myself, you're getting hosed. But the only answer you have at this point, because I wasn't political, is make sure you make enough money. Don't sweat it, bro. Anyway, they said there was a lot of concern in Congress, at least among Republicans, about the leak of the wiretap Flynn Kislyak conversation. Such intelligence is classified at the highest level of secrecy, secrecy that someone, Republicans suspected Obama appointees in the Justice Department and the intelligence community, revealed it to the press. So here's what's interesting about the Flynn thing. The Obama administration had its hide. They got their skin on the wall. You know, the head, the skin on the floor, head on the wall, you know, the Hunter analogy. And they got him. They got Flynn. He admits to some, you know, BS lie. Oh, you told us this the other day. You said this. Now you're saying this. Which is it, Mr. Flynn? And he, you know, he bit. He bit. He blinked. So th- that's how that occurred. But what's interesting about it is the, the, the Democrats, what's funny, they always end up screwing themselves over because in such a zeal to get to Flynn, they forgot they were going to, you know, essentially expose trade craft, trade secrets on how they did it. That's what sort of ratcheted everything up to how did they possibly know when they told uh, the, what Trump had said to the Mexican president and the Australian prime minister. Then people were like, wait a minute, this is beyond some insider because you can't say it's Reince Priebus or Katie. What's her face? Uh, that used to work for Priebus and all that when they were nowhere near this conversation. I'm in my office talking only to the Australian prime minister and something I said leaks into the New York times. That's when Trump made the declaration. The Obama administration is spying on me and they said he's crazy unhinged, etc. Where do we find ourselves now? Even Flynn is now saying, I'm, remove me from my deal. I'm now going to start looking into suing for my freedom. And not only that, and I hope he goes this far. I hope he absolutely rakes these other suckers over the coal who made him put his house up for mortgage, etc. I talked about this the other day. All the, the financial hardships that this man were created by this man who served his country well. Shameful, because now we learn... They didn't even think he was guilty. You want to know why? Because he wasn't. Shameful, Comey, Obama, Clinton, all you leftists. He won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. The Kevin Jackson Radio Show. The Obama Painting. Welcome, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. It is the Kevin Jackson Show. KJRadio.com. Give us a buzz at 844-551-8255. The Obama Painting. So the the guy that painted this thing, I I talked about this, uh, just touched on it because it was going to be coming out and uh, was aware of that. Anyway, he's a, a racist. And the guy, there's no way his work should be in the Smithsonian in and of itself. But what a what a disgrace this piece of work was. When you think about the presidential portraits that are going to sit in the Smithsonian and you go back and you look at all these white dudes, right? They've all got the paneled wall. And look, I'm not telling people you don't you you don't have to buck tradition and things like that from time to time but there are certain traditions that you say this is the way things look go into a board of directors room you know or the the boardroom and you'll see the pictures of the people who've you know been the CEO or whatever and it's the same pose and it's it's a, a presidential and 
You know, it's funny to me how people talk about Barack Obama being so presidential when this is the dude who rolled up his sleeves and, you know, kind of had that cocky, cool walk. And that was considered presidential. And I'm sure there's somebody who's going to look at this guy surrounded in this crazy ivy and think it's presidential. I think it's a joke. What a piece of work. And the the artist says, well, I, I, I was around the president and I took thousands of pictures. He took thousands of pictures, <clears throat> pardon me, to elongate this dude's hands. One of them looks really afflicted. His, his left foot looks like it's broken. And then he's engulfed in this crazy bush. Somebody gave me the name of it, like a hukuku bush. <laughs> and the, I'll be honest with you. The first thing I thought when I saw that stupid bush was I went, this guy, in, in, this is a perfect scenario for Barack Obama where you put him inside of this, this vine, this bush that grows around stuff. And it would, in, in a year it's engulfed him. And what a metaphor for putting him in a chair in a garden and then suddenly this bush engulfs him and he disappears. If there's anybody that has made the relevancy of Barack Obama as it pertains to America, very clear. It's been Donald Trump, zero relevancy of Barack Obama. Let's get rid of it all. Scuttle the ship. It's not worth it. And I think that is so cool (laughs) <laughs> that this guy who makes a big deal about the unveiling of this poor and, and all the effort that went into it, that quite frankly could have been done at a high school art fair. What a joke. People have ridiculed this thing. They've got Obama sitting on a toilet. Uh, a couple of them have him. One had him sitting on a toilet in the same pose. Another one I saw had him sitting on the toilet with his pants down. <laughs> I mean, it's been ridiculed. One of them <laughs> had him sitting... <laughs> This is my favorite. Had him with a MAGA hat. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. What a fantasy. I mean, look, if if there are people that still see this man as a big deal, congratulations. I give it one more year. Honestly, it isn't going to take that long. But just to be on the safe side, give it one more year and watch the number of people who say, I wish I'd never voted for him. I it was a lady. Who was it? She wrote to me and she said the first time she go, I think she, she didn't, she didn't say she did it, but I'm pretty sure she did. She says that I can see people voting for him the first time, but, and, and uh, I was listening to her going or reading her word going, Mm-mm, you were one that voted for him the first time. I've learned how to sniff them out. It's like people that have that gaydar. <laughs> you got a gaydar. I got the Obama gaydar where I know you voted for that metrosexual pansy the first time. And I can even tell you the ones who voted twice and now have buyer's remorse. If you really want to measure them, the ones who voted twice and have buyer's remorse are really upset with him. They're the ones that are going, I, I can't believe I voted twice for that guy because they bought into the he just needs more time theory. Now, look, uh, back to this portrait. I don't know what guys are supposed to do with this, but I know this. Regardless of what my personal opinions would be about this particular thing, you know, like what what should happen, uh, put me on a horse in a helicopter, you know, climbing, scaling the Grand Canyon or whatever it may be. Or in my case, I'd probably say, hey, paint me in the ring, you know, doing some martial arts because that would be cool. But I would go, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to just do this the way other people have done it and continue the tradition of this. Do other presidents think, do you know if they go in the Smithsonian? I'm pretty sure they do because I think they probably have a room for presidents. But I want you to just picture that. And people on Twitter have been doing that. They've been showcasing all the other presidential portraits. And then they put this stupid green backdrop ivy a president in there and you just look at it and you go, what? It isn't enough that Barack Obama sticks out like a, you know, I don't know, like I could give you 50 different analogies. I'm not going to bother, but he sticks out. (laughs) He's the only black dude, fully, well, half black guy that looks like he's black in there. Eisenhower was 25% white, black, but nobody knows that. Not many people know that, but you got this guy, you're black. You're already sticking out. Do a regular portrait. End of story. And oh, by the way, get a guy who can actually do your likeness the way it should be. Now, I'll give him credit. In the face, he he captures Obama. But 
and 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 obviously in a bit of his continence, but that cr- that crooked left foot looks like er uh, er, uh, right? I don't understand that. It's a crooked left foot, it elongated hands in one hand. It looks like it's reptilian. D- don't believe me? Go look at the stupid portrait. Oh, oh, you're mad because I did the er uh, er. Uh. I'm saying like a seal, his foot, you know, was, was all afflicted looking, you know, a uh, 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 seal. You know, not, I'm not making fun of anybody. So w- what's this about? I don't get it. it it's it. I considered it a bit of a slap in the face. Do you, do you guys agree? I mean, I, I looked at it and said, why couldn't you just do what everybody else did? You got to do something different. And the artist he chose, holy cow, I did a little bit of research. This guy has a, a picture of a black chick holding a, a white girl, the head of a white girl, like the way Kathy Griffin held Barack, uh, held Trump's head. And I'm going, who, who is this clown? He's going to get national attention, get his work in the Smithsonian. By the way, it would have never gotten in there, in my opinion. And I'm no art critic. I mean, I happen to enjoy art. I'm into art. But really, that's who you choose? It's like Barack Obama's looking for ways to just, you know, moon america it, it why do you hate us so much is my was my question anyway we got a ton to talk about parade or no parade i had a conversation with a guy i want to talk about that i want to talk about trump's tax cuts we got a lot to sell Keep it this is the kevin jackson radio show do you owe back taxes to the irs or state the secret to avoiding the irs nightmare is to seek professional representation My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. Me and a buddy of mine were having a conversation. It was a debate, actually, on his radio show live. And he says to me, so, Kevin, you know, what do you think about this military parade that Donald Trump wants to have? Welcome, everybody. It's the Kevin Jackson Radio Show, KJRadio.com. So he asked me this. He puts me on the spot. I don't know. I'm, I haven't even thought about that. That's such, It's a non-issue to me. If Trump wants to have a parade, my attitude is he's the president. Give the man a parade. What? Hollywood can have award shows. Businesses can have sales meetings. Give the man his parade. So my buddy, who's a a libertarian, never served a minute in the military. He's like, I think it's really stupid. I think it's a waste of taxpayer money. Uh, It's something that a third world nation would do, like North Korea or somebody else. You know, they have the parade with the big stompers, you know, the legs, guys kicking their legs up and down. And they're running the missiles down the middle of some big speech uh, street. 
rather. And, um, you know, they got, whatever. I don't know what else they do. I don't know what they do in these parades. I was in the middle. I was in military school. We had parades, uh, IG inspections. We had all kinds of parades. They have, a. uh, uh Parades where people get ranks. They have a par- uh, uh, when people retire, they have par- uh, retiring parades. Oh, well, I can't get that out. They got parades for a lot of stuff in the military. And I'll tell you right now, I hated parades because for the most part, you know, you you stood there and and I don't know if you've ever stood in a in a temperate zone in a parade, but mosquitoes eat you alive and you can't move in military. Not the Marines. Marine Military Academy, man, you're standing there, and here's what you're doing to blow mosquitoes off your face. You're trying to get anything to get that mosquito off because you cannot move. And then if it landed on your arm, you know what you would do? do you know, do, would you got, what do you think you do? No, you don't slap it. You can't slap it. No. You know what you do? You would squeeze your muscles and try to get the, the mosquitoes uh, thing stuck in there. So he would finally pop <laughs> and leave you alone. That's what you do. You couldn't move. And and so, you know, our, the, it was hot and muggy. It's, you know, you're talking 70 degrees relative humidity or higher and 95, 100 degrees. You would be a, a to, you would be totally drenched in sweat when you were done with a military parade. So that's what I, I hated them. But I loved them, too. Because it was a way for us to check out ourselves and, you know, you had polished your brass and your shoes and all this stuff and everything folded two fingers apart, your shirts and all that other stuff starts to a T. And suddenly you get to use it all because it's just sitting in your, for the most part, we wore dungarees and boots. And, you know, and so when you weren't, when, when it was time to do something else, you got to put on the rest of the stuff. You got to do the drills. Uh, sometimes when it was the parents weekend, we'd go out and do a parade and then they would, uh, they do a, our drill team would perform or the mounted detachment or whatever. It was a way to, it's like I tell people in the martial arts, you, you study, 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 and then you go to a tournament and you get to fight. You get to do something and tournaments are scary and you don't always win, but it was something to do because you generally are not fighting. So anyway, we're having this discussion and my buddy's like, it's a waste of time. And Donald Trump, you know, it's like a third world dictator. And I said, first of all, that's ridiculous. I said, and he goes, what are they going to do? Run missiles up and down the street? And I said, see, there you go. You don't even know what he's going to do. Trump supposedly saw Bastille Day and it showed the French troops marching down some big boulevard. So maybe they would all go down Pennsylvania Avenue. What's wrong with that? What Donald Trump is trying to say is, Respect the flag, respect, respect the anthem, respect the military. Lord knows the military is not respected these days because of leftism. So we're having this debate. My friend, in my opinion, is insulting the military because he's like, you know, these guys don't even want it. And I go, how do you know? I got a friend of a friend or whatever. And I said, well, why don't you ask the military people? Look, I said, I was in military school. I hated the parades, but there was a part of me that understood it, and I loved the part of it that I understood. I was willing to tolerate it for that reason. And he says, there's nobody in the military who wants to do it. So then he took phone calls, and people were calling in, I agree with Kevin. I agree with Kevin. I'm ex-military. I hated parades, but I understand the, the significance. I understand the symbolism of what Donald Trump's trying to do. I understand what's going on today in the, in the climate of, of what the military is about. Blah, 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 to a person. Then you got one guy. They called in and goes, I'm neutral. I hated parades. I'm neutral. Okay. So I was five to zero or something like that. Then finally a military guy calls in and says, I hated parades. And I think it's stupid. We do a parade. So then, so we're all good. He's saying it, it's the cost. So I said, okay, well then what about so before this is before he said the third world dictator thing. So he says, it's a cost. Why would we, should we pay for a parade? Why can't they take that money and put it somewhere else? And I said, well, first of all, you know, we waste a lot of money on a lot of different things if you want to call it a waste. But I said, there are things that you do that are symbolic that mean something to others. It, 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 it's worth the money because it means something. It's like a company sales meeting. Why do you have a big hoopla session 
to give out awards and do all this other stuff. The money could be used for something better, but it isn't. Well, that's private money. I said, so what you're saying is you okay with a parade if it were funded with private money? I just don't see any difference for it. It's like all this third world, dict- third world dictator stuff. So I said, aha, so you don't like parades for the military. You're calling a parade something that's supposed to boost the morale of the military, the people that support the moral- the military. Forget what the military thinks. People like parades. People want to see what they've paid for. So what you're saying is that that is in, in and of itself is a, is a third world type of a military move. And you're calling Donald Trump a third world dictator. Now he gets a little defensive. That's not really what I'm saying. Yes, it is. Because if it were privately funded, you still just said it looks like something a third world nation would do. So now I've got him over a barrel because I know his motivation is he's trying to say that It looks, it has the appearance of this, you know, it looks like what North Korea would do and all that. Then he brings up the missiles. They're going to be putting all these missiles. I said, you don't know that. And he didn't. Now, look, here's my thing. I don't care about a parade. I really don't. But I do understand it. If they had it, I would be trying to figure out how to go. Because you know what? I feel good about the military. Now, I feel good that we have a different commander in chief, a guy who's not concerned about being PC in the military and letting transsexuals in and giving new rules on don't ask, don't tell and all this nonsense. And he's actually going to bring the military back. I I think it would be a great thing. I think many in the military would say, you know what, I'd suffer through that on behalf of, of President Trump. I'm glad we got rid of that clown, Barack Obama. I'm curious what you think, though. Which of us is right? Now, I'm going to be a spoiler here. More people called in agreeing with me than agreeing with my buddy, Gary. But, but Gary, you know, Gary makes a legitimate point. Why should we pay for these things and all that? But here was the other thing I told him. I said, why is it an in, in some game? Why is it, you know, he was like, that money could go to, and he starts naming all these things, educate. And I go, look, th- th- there's money in all these different programs. That, there's lots of money that could go to help vets. W- you know, if we're going to look at budget items. We don't need to look at this parade. That's the last place to look. He acts like that's the only place they could get the money was from the military. There's tons of waste in government. Anyway, let me know your thoughts. I'm curious. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. Donald Trump has a big old budget, over $4 trillion. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm not happy about it. Glad you guys are here. Kevin Jackson, George, what you're listening to, kjradio.com. You listen to this show a lot. And I know you do. You're, you're faithful listeners. And let me tell you, I have you know, more praise on president Trump than, you know, I probably have any president there. I've I've actually canonized the man. I think he's better than Reagan in many ways, but I'll tell you this. I'm not happy about a government that is spending four trillion, over $4 trillion. I don't know what it'll come back to be. Now, here's what I suspect. I suspect Donald Trump is giving these guys this crazy budget so that the left will demonize it and go, this is crazy. And then he'll say, well, hey, God, tell you what, cut it. Give give me something, you know, to work with. And then it'll come back. It'll settle under four trillion dollars, which is still going to be bad, but it'll be a negotiation. And hopefully, hopefully he's doing this to say we're we're going to put the money where keep in mind a big part of the federal budget. He has zero control over. It's entitlements. And I'm going to tell you right now, until a president has the guts to tackle entitlements, we're toast. We have too much money that's going to people that are no longer in the workforce. And in some cases, when I talk about entitlements, I'm not talking about Social Security. You've earned your Social Security. Uh, That's part of the insurance. But we... (laughs) Look, it's it's too convoluted to go into, but here's the thing. There, when we talk about Medicare, Medicaid, and some of these other things that we're putting into into play, welfare, and so on and so forth, we can't sustain that. So we've got to address those things at some point. Now, Donald Trump is smart in the sense of saying, I don't think we can address those now. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. 
I don't I think this is where we're going to really get into some issues with the president. And, and I'll be right there, you know, beating him up if I don't agree with these fiscal policies. The only thing that staves this stuff off is a booming economy. So let me get put things in perspective, because his tax cuts and all the things that he's implemented, they do work. Understand that they do work. And much to the chagrin of the Democrats, I'll go into his budget later. I don't want to do that right now. I really want to go into the tax cuts, because here's the thing. When people get their money back, they spend it on their own uh, tax generating actions, meaning you'll go out and buy things that generate sales taxes, etc. You uh, you may start a business that generates sale, you know taxes for corporate, etc. That's what I think is beginning to spur the economy. So, t- well, I mean, there's a lot of things that are spurring the economy, like getting rid of owners le- legislation and things like this. But I'm saying wh- what I'm about to give you news wise is great news. What's happened under the tax plan? The federal government in January ran a surplus and it collected record tax revenues for the for the month of January. Record tax years. January was the first month under the new tax law that President Trump signed in in December. During January, the Treasury collected $361 billion, spent $311 billion, and had a revenue surplus of approximately $49 billion and change. I mean, I would take the rounding error because it's $236 million. But we put in the bank, so to speak, fifty, almost $50 billion. Now, that's unheard of. Now, we're still running a deficit of 175, almost $176 billion for the fiscal year of 2018, which started in October. So October, November, December, and now January. But January of the $175, $176 billion, we just took fifty, roughly $50 billion off of what could have happened because you're starting to see the effects. Now, if you take $50 billion off every month going forward, you can do the math. You're going to be at $600 billion by the end of the year which would mean that we would at some point start to eat into the national debt. Now, interestingly, the tsunami effect of the Trump tax cuts haven't even kicked in. And you're already seeing the benefits. So you've heard me talk about it, but what are we waiting for? So let's let's analyze that for just a second. First of all, we're waiting on the trade policies to kick in. The man who now practices the art of the deal for America and not on behalf of his own business, had the arduous task of undoing Obama and other leftist policies as it pertains to trade. And remember, this is what people were really upset about. You know, He's not part of the TPP and he's going to do NAFTA and all this. And Trump said, I don't care what you guys think. I've, seen, I've watched what's happened over the years in trade and this is now my business. And I'm going to run it the way I would run Trump Enterprises. So he's retooled trade. He went to Canada and said, we're no longer getting our lumber from you. He's not completely addressed Mexico, but he just addressed uh, South Korea, as you guys may remember, with, I don't know exactly, but it was like uh, 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 washing machines and things like that. And of course, the left screams, what is this consumer going to do if they got to go out and buy new washing machines? Maybe they'll get them from Whirlpool, <laughs> the Amer- American manufacturer. And they go, well, they're going to pay more. No, not necessarily. There's used machines. You know, the, the, but here's the deal. It's American business. If you got to pay 50 bucks more for your washing machine, so be it. So be it. You're, the, the overall input into the economy, it's worth that extra 50 bucks that you pay. That's what Democrats would say. So. He's shifting this over. So, but it was a warning bell to South Korea. And we run, I don't know, I think it's like a 30, roughly a $30 billion budget, deficit, a trade deficit with South Korea. He's putting the same warning out to Japan. And, of course, China has already started to address it. Now, our trade deficit went up with China initially. No problem. No harm, no foul. He's got the Chinese working against the North Koreans. 
in, in helping with Russia. So he's Trump is like, I'll get to them. But we have this trade looming. In other words, the 183 products that we can now sell to China, that queue is being loaded. So sometime in late 2018, 2019, you're going to start to see that trade gap with China lessen. It increased so far, but it will lessen. It increased because we have an economy that's booming. And we before we could load the queue and, and balance that trade deficit, we used to, it was Christmas time. So we were like, come on, China, bring that stuff in. So that tsunami is waiting to occur. Then what he did was something else. Very brilliant. President Trump shifted the war on terror away from America and onto the rest of the world, particularly the Middle East. He returned from Saudi Arabia. You guys remember me talking about this. $350 billion arms package, largest in the history of the country. And he says to the Saudis, you are going to have to take care of yourselves. He said to the Middle East, there was another country. I can't remember who it was. Bahrain, I believe. But he, they, they bought a package of F-16s. He says, hey, I'm giving, we're going to give you a lot of technology. You're going to fight the war on terror. He's put the signal out to the world. We're pulling out of the war on terror. We've spent trillions of worthless dollars. That's going to go into the United States of America, our infrastructure, our veterans, our schools, whatever. And you're going to be fighting this war on your own. And the only way you're going to get into our booming economy is if you keep terrorism on the decline. Now, we'll help you. We'll bomb ISIS into submission. We'll do some other things here and there. But we're not going to be chiefly responsible. And that's huge. That's huge. Because I want you to imagine a safer world. Imagine a world where you weren't having to put in, you know, just layers and layers of security. Don't misunderstand me. We're never going to be safe, completely safe. But if you don't have to put layers and layers of security in and you can put to think about it for like one of these African countries where nobody is bothering anybody. You, you want to know why nobody's bothering uh, some of these, you know, little countries that Chad or whatever. They don't make anything. They don't do anything. They're jealous. And that's what makes people bother you. But if everybody's economy begins to boom, it becomes a p- more peaceful world. And that's what we're looking for. Look, the Muslims want to have their world over there. Fine. We'll even come visit and and we'll follow your rules and we'll say, hey, I was over there. And, and hopefully you'll respect us. But we have to have a safer world. So Trump has put in all these policies that are taking pushing the, the financial burdens onto other people, including things like NATO, pushing that burden out. And then he says, what are we going to do with our money? We're going to put. What it would be like 1.5 trillion in the infrastructure. You're taking a builder who says we are going to build better roads, better bridges. We're going to build better airports. We're going to have the the top technology in all of these areas. And we're not going to be wasteful about it. And oh, by the way, we're going to build a wall and we're going to protect our borders. We're going to respect our sovereignty. So when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about this tax cut because the left has lamented this. Oh, you can't be cutting taxes. It's for the rich and all these other things. And the fact of the matter is this tax cut is the reason that America's economy is going to boom and has boomed. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com.
putting an end to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. KJRadio.com. We were talking about the tax cut and the surplus of almost $50 billion that we experienced in January, the first full month of December being under the new tax plan. So we've got this surplus, still got a deficit that we're running, obviously, for the year. And uh, you could call it Trump's year. He inherited a mess, and we'll get, get into some of that. But uh, and, and he's got a massive uh, budget that, that's coming up, and we're going to discuss that separately. But I was recapping some of the reasons why Donald Trump is sort of taking this Reagan-esque bet on the economy. And I've given you a couple of things that uh, earlier that we talked about, like the uh, tr- the ta- the trade policy of Donald Trump is going to kick in and roar in like a tsunami. I, b- I firmly believe that we're going to reduce our trade deficit of roughly 580, give, give or take billion dollars down to something reasonable. And we'll use the U.S. economy to make this happen. Um, in other words, we're, when whatever else that we with that Donald Trump needs to do with that economy and that deficit, he'll use it as a pawn as a tool. So if he says we're going to maintain a $300 billion trade deficit with China, he's going to expect them to do something for us and deliver. Because ultimately, as he shifts manufacturing back, we will depend a lot less on the Chinese. And as we continue to innovate and do things and make things that the Chinese want, they're not going to have the capacity to fulfill it in their own manufacturing. And so, you know, it's a, it's all a trade off. But I think that we have the, the best negotiator so to speak. But a couple of the things that that are that haven't kicked in yet in this economy that Donald Trump is betting on are the businesses. Now, part of it did. The tax cut gave an immediate stimulus in the form of bonuses, some salary increases. And you're going to watch the Americans respond by spending money. And that's what we're kind of seeing right now. But what's ultimately going to happen is when these guys actually start building their manufacturing plants here and producing products here and expanding the tax base. What happens when a business is, you know, you get Apple that says we're going to bring something, you know, back to the United States and it's going to be 20,000 jobs. So people go, what's the big deal about 20,000 jobs? That's no big deal. 20,000 jobs is nothing. 20,000 jobs creates, I don't know, 50,000, 70,000, 100,000 jobs. I, I, when I was calling on General Dynamics before they got bought, uh, I don't know how many people were employed out there, but it was at least 10,000 people at the facility in Fort Worth. The businesses that lined up along there, eateries, barbecue joints, sandwich shops, dry cleaners, mechanics, etc. That's what, and then what the business that supported that business. So you had machine tool shops and all kinds of stuff. So these are the people that those businesses support. And it's at least a two, a two X multiplier. So if you've got 20,000 employees, you can expect 40,000 support people outside of that. The federal government is a good example. It's got X number of employees, but the number of people that support the fed is, is probably a 10 X multiplier to be honest with you. So you have tons of, of businesses that spring up after this. These major corporations have started investing back in America because they're saying, why go overseas when the top market in the world is right in your backyard? So these immediate tax cuts and all that, you know, are good. But the long range implication the <clears throat> pardon me, the jobs that get built, that get created from having to create these manufacturing plants. Think about when somebody does a manufacturing plant. They don't just they don't just add water. They got to get uh, all types of people that get the plant going. So you're talking about a two year project before it even starts. Now that let's say you're going to build that plant in some you know anywhere Tennessee, all those workers are going to be working building the plant. They're shifting gears. Now they have to understand they got to sock their duckies away and then, you know, but there's going to be a glut for that type of, of uh, product, you know, for what's happening there. And you'll have people coming in temporarily to help build it, understanding that when they go back, you know, they're going to have to go find something else to do. Meanwhile, the corporation starts staffing. So they begin the staffing thing. And then other planners, the, the subway shops and the Kentucky fried chickens and the, 
you know, dry cleaners and all the national chains start springing up. You ever gone through a city and you're like, God, that this little area looks like a cookie cutter of this little area, looks like a cookie cutter of this little area. All these urban planners are looking at this stuff and that's how it happens. That's why you don't drive 50 miles to go to your mall. You'll drive seven to 10 miles. That's why you have, you know, it, it literally, it looks like a peel the onion back. I've got a convenience store. I've got, you know, a, a, a series of strip malls. I've got the mall and then, you know, and you just keep branching out and you, you've got all types of restaurants. It isn't like you've got to, well, the only steakhouse is I got to drive 30 miles to go to Phoenix. No. There'll be a steakhouse in a Mexican place or there'll be in Phoenix. So there'll be 16 Mexican places within a rock throw. There'll be a couple of Chinese places, a sushi place. There'll be the fast food joints. There'll be the grocery stores and the, you know, everything else. That's how it works. And that's the bigger piece of the business. And that's, you know, of the tax cut. That's the part that, that will come in like a tsunami. And the other thing is the, uh, the Trump is not going to let, dollars flow out that used to go to countries that hate us he's saying no to that his, also his budget is cutting the marketing machine of the left anyway we'll go I, I want to cover the budget separately but i just want to make people understand that a lot of the things that that are going to be spur the growth in this country even including the infrastructure piece which i think he's allocated over a trillion dollars for infrastructure imagine you're a highway guy and, you know, or and hit roads and bridges, the, the people involved in that. And, you know, for the next 10 years, you are gainfully employed because th this money that's going to be put in the infrastructure is and is going to go to work for you. It, you know, I mean, going to go to work for America where we really improve our roads and bridges and really improve our national parks and really improve our airports is going to happen. But I want to look at the numbers just so you guys can put it in perspective, because um Let's look at what Barack Obama did. He, when he left office in 2000, January 20th of 2017, the, the, um, the deficit, or the debt rather, was $19.947 trillion, right under $20 trillion. So Barack Obama added $9 trillion to the debt because he inherited $10.6 trillion from when he took office, sworn in date to leaving date, more than any other president. And the thing that's misleading about that is he took he got Bush to give him seven hundred and eighty seven billion dollars for this stimulus that was going to save the economy. Now, I want to the reason why I want to put this in perspective is I want you to understand how much that Barack Obama added each year. So uh, this the budget deficit that Obama had in fiscal year 2009. And I believe this is correct is uh, roughly one point uh one point one six trillion dollars. Now to put that in Trump perspective, Trump theoretically inherited a twenty trillion dollar deficit and it's twenty point six as I sit here today. So he's added six hundred billion dollars to the deficit as, as in his first year as opposed to one point one six trillion that was added by Barack Obama. But that dis doesn't include Barack Obama's begging Bush for almost eight hundred billion dollars. So Barack Obama would have added almost two trillion dollars to the debt in some of its interest, by the way. And so Trump has a higher interest rate and he's added six hundred billion. But here's B Barack Obama's deficits from fiscal year on. So 10 fiscal year 10, one point three trillion, 11, one point three trillion, 12, one point one trillion. Uh, 13, 679, 485, 438, 585, and then he gave Trump a $666 billion deficit. So there was a rise towards the end. The rise was, in, in, it went down to 438 in, in, in fiscal year 2016. It went to 585 and then 666, and it started rising back up because Barack Obama could no longer keep a, a Band-Aid on the bullet hole. So, what I'm getting at is this Trump inherits an economy that was starting to rot. The deficit was starting to rise. It rose. It put six hundred billion dollars of debt of debt in his first fiscal year. And now it's starting to erode. OK, now still got big issues ahead of us. I'm, I'm not letting, letting Trump off the hook in any way, shape or form. This new budget 
is something we're going to discuss in more depth because I want to have a little bit more time to analyze it. So, and I'm not happy about it at all. It's too much money. We need to stop the spending. But I do believe that Trump is looking at it and saying, okay, I'm going to expand this, use it as a negotiation to get it down, and then eventually we'll start to cut. But I want to start seeing those cuts or else I'm going to be talking pretty, pretty bad. I'm going to be talking some smack about President Trump's budget. Got to leave it there. He won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show.